to dedicate this episode of the podcast to my friend Joyce because we're going to be talking about the Apollo 11 lunar landing that happened in the summer of 1969. And that just so happens to be the time that she married her wonderful husband, Harlan, and they recently celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, guys. And thank you, Joyce, for being such a great friend. Thank you also for supporting me as an author and for supporting the Schulenberg Public Library. You see, Joyce serves as a board member of the Friends of the Schulenberg Public Library, which is an organization that works tirelessly to make sure our public library is amazing, which, by the way, it is. Not only are there tons of books, but there are also tons of activities. See, Joyce reached out to me when I first moved to town and invited me to the local library's anniversary event, and I was so honored. But I also love the public library. It's amazing, which, by the way, if you're ever going through Schulenburg, Texas, you have to check it out. Especially for a town this small, our library is amazing. And, you know, libraries are really cool because, you know, there's super cool events for kids like llamas, petting zoos, reading events, also adult, adult events, um, Spanish language lessons, tax lessons, you name it, we're probably doing it at a local library. But they also are the steward of our books, okay? And if you know how to read and you can appreciate a book, you're never going to be bored a moment in your life because books transport us to places that we could never imagine. I love books, and the public library is an amazing asset to our community, especially the Schulenberg Public Library. So thank you, Joyce. And in honor of you, I'd like to read one of my favorite quotes about books and why they're so amazing. And it's by another amazing person, Carl Sagan, who, by the way, is a really cool astrophysicist. And this is what Carl had to say about books. What an astonishing thing a book is. It's a flat object made from a tree with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person. Maybe somebody dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. A book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. Welcome to the universe in a seashell, the podcast dedicated to science, life, and girl power. I'm Kara Bartek, and I'm your host. I'm a PhD, an author, and I want to make this world a more equal and opportune place, one girl at a time. Yo, yo, yo! Welcome to the podcast, The Universe in a Seashell, the podcast dedicated to science, life, and girl power. I am Kara Bartek, and I'm your host. And today I am joined by my regular co host, Cece. Hi. And I have a very special guest host. Her name is Ava T. What's up, Ava? Hi. Now, Ava, how old are you? I'm eight years old. Okay, what grade are you going to be going into? I'm going to be going into third grade. Do you love science? Yes, because my mom's a science teacher in Columbus. Holla! Seventh grade science. That's that's a good age, right? You, you are learning a ton of science. So does she do a lot of science experiments with you and let you have slime in the house? Well, she doesn't really like slime and Play-Doh, so she doesn't really let me make slime. But I try to figure out a way to beg her, so I'm like, Mom, please! And she's like, no. I can totally understand not allowing slime in the house because Cece over here somehow allowed slime to melt into our couch. Is that is that or is that not true? I only melted Swiss cheese into the couch. Uh, that was definitely not Swiss cheese. That was 
full blown slime. It glue was Swiss and cheese. What kind of slime was it? Did you make it yourself or did you make it at dance camp? It was Swiss cheese. Tell think, the, please tell the truth. It was Swiss cheese. I, I still think the full moon is affecting her. Pay no attention to Cece. Yeah, I have a quick little science thing. My mom actually told, told me this yesterday. Actually, because the uh, it's a full moon, so the moon um, makes the tides uh, in the ocean go crazy big. So it it affects people's hormones, so they get all cranky and like, Well, you must have been listening to our Moon Madness episode because we talked all about how the moon affects uh, plants, animals, the tides, and us. And it's true. And guess what? Science backs it up. And your mom knows because she's a science teacher, right? Yes. And if and one little fact, if you need, a t- need me to come over to talk about, you know, like space or body parts, then just call me right over and I'll tell you all the answers. Well, I, I feel like I have a good new uh, permanent guest host. What do you think, Cece? If you if you keep saying Swiss cheese into the mic, I'm going to have to fire you. I like Swiss cheese. Mm-hmm. She's fired. Yeah, let, let's let's fire her. Let's fire her. You're but fired. Anyway, but anyway, so so Ava, I'm not sure if you know, but what we're doing all this these these next few weeks up until the the height of the person meteor shower the podcast is going to be dedicated to the sky and sky watching especially in the summer so we're always trying to find really fun activities to do when you know you guys act like you're horribly bored and life stinks and you just want to you know die from boredom well guess guess what there are are a, a million fun things to do that involve science and nature, and one of them is to watch the sky. So the past few episodes, we've been talking about the moon. We talked about the seas on the moon, which are called what, CC? And please don't say Swiss cheese, or you really are fired. Um, let me think. Uh, this is quiz time. Do, 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 the sea tranquility? <laughs> That's one of the seas. That is the name of the sea, but the the technical term for the seas on the moon. Mara. That's right. The mare. Mare. So, sorry. So mare. since the moon doesn't have oceans like the ones that we have on Earth, they have these big lava flows that have happened over time. They've they've been caused by all of the meteor strikes that have happened to the moon, and they form these pools of lava or what we call the seas or the mare and we can actually see them from earth those are those dark spots on the moon you know sometimes when you look at the full moon and it looks like there's a face up there we call it the man on the moon a lot of times Mm -hmm. um well the that face has actually been formed through the lava flow and those 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 dark spots are called the mare or the seas okay speaking about the moon i don't know if y'all knew this but when earth and uranus are distant from the sun like like a pinky square away uh the moon actually does something really cool and it's called a throbbing moon so when they so when there's pinky space um when the sun is going down for us at earth they actually connect and then the moon changes like you know um a little, like a blue color. Uh-huh. It's called a throbbing moon. Dude, that is super cool. We're going to have to find a link for that and put it in the episode notes. That's a super cool piece of knowledge. Can I go swimming in the mares? I'll get all my floaties. Cece, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get all my floaties. <laughs> uh, right now, I, I really wish you could take a lava bath because you're you're kind of getting on my nerves with this whole Swiss cheese thing. Okay, are you ready to talk about dun, 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 dun. the first man who ever walked on the moon? Oh, yeah. And have you ever known that the U.S. flag was placed on the moon first? D- Stop getting ahead of me. You're looking at my notes. Obviously, you're looking at my notes. Don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. I'm sorry. It's just I learned it in, in this year, actually. We learned about... Um, the, um, the U.S. flag, so 
I know it, so just calm your, your calm down. You know what? People actually watched him foot put put his his foot onto the moon. Yeah, that was actually the first footprint. His name was like James John, and then I forgot his last name. But I Neil Armstrong, remember? Yes. You are correct. Okay, okay, wait a second, wait a second. Before we talk about the actual moon landing, I've got a few items that I want to remind the audience about. Okay. Number one, if you guys are out there listening, please make sure that you're subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast. It's great be feedback for me. Let me know what's working, what's not working, but it also raises the visibility of the podcast, okay? It brings us higher in the charts. So, you know, this podcast is all about making this world a more equal and opportune place, one girl at a time. And I can't do that alone. I need your help. So please, make sure you tell your friends what you're listening to. Subscribe, rate, and review. Also, drop me a line. Let me know how your summer sky watching is going. Remember, my email is universeinaseashell at gmail.com. Again, that's universeinaseashell at gmail.com. Okay, Ms. Kira. So, you want all your people to subscribe and rate and review. Well, tell them to go from number one. And what's this number? What is uh, this um, one, what number is this that you made? This is going to be either episode 9 or episode 10. I can't remember. Okay. So, go from number 1, go from which either 9 or 10, subscribe, review, and rate. And then tell Miss Kira what your summer watching has been going, how, how it's been going. Thank you, Miss Ava. You're welcome. Okay. So, make sure you're speaking really loudly into the microphone so everybody can hear you. And I want to give you guys a little heads up on a scientific discovery that was recently made. Now, you know that in my Serafina Love Science books, the second book is all about Serafina and her best friend, Tori Copper. Well, the underlying scientific principle in this book is actually quantum entanglement. And I'm not going to tell you how this all works in because you got to read the book. It's, it's pretty interesting. So not only can you read about how Serafina helps her best friend Tori Copper go through one of the most difficult things in her life, which is her parents' divorce, but she uses the principle of quantum entanglement to help her friend. Okay, now, quantum entanglement has been purely theoretical for as long as scientists have been talking about it, okay? So Einstein actually called it spooky action at a distance. So, Cece, could you explain to us what quantum entanglement is? Why would Einstein call this principle spooky action at a distance? <laughs> the mic just fell off. They call it spooky action from a distance because... There, when two particles conjoin, they stay together and they go in this um, way that's called the up and down. Yeah, so, so when two particles have been joined, they get into this pattern or this relationship of spinning. So when one particle is at the top of its spin cycle, the other one would be at the bottom. Right. And if someone tries to like split it, it's always going to be together in that spin cycle. It, it remains the same. It's kind of like they're connected by some force or field that we don't understand. Or like an invisible string. Exactly. But here's the deal, guys. Up until here, just very recently, this was purely theoretical. We, we didn't have any direct proof that this was something that was actually happening. And, you know, that's the big thing in science. You have to have direct proof that something is happening for it to be a scientific fact. Well, guess what? A team of researchers at the University of Glasgow actually successfully photographed a quantum particle after it has been entangled. Okay, so we, we have photographic evidence. So this has moved from theory to fact in our lifetime. And this, this is a big deal. By the end of his career, Einstein 
he he had basically given up on quantum entanglement. He said, you know, I, I just don't think that I'm ever going to fully understand how this action works. Well, guess what? These guys figured it out. And I'm going to link I'm going to link that article in the the, the show notes that'll be uploaded to iTunes, to Spotify. Again, if you just look in your your podcast player, you'll be able to see the the link to this article cuz you got to check out these images. They kind of look like a I don't know, what did it look like? Kind of like a big circle. That's all that's all I was seeing. It's like a tiny circle. It's basic, you know how particles look if you see them in your mind or if you see them like in a picture? They look like these tiny balls. That's what they might that's what they might look like. So nobody really knows what they look like. So Kayla, what you're saying is like a grain of sand, like a tiny tiny particle of sand will look like what you just said, a um what a, what is it called? A particle. No, uh what Miss Carrie just said. Not a particle. You're talking about the quantum entanglement principle? Yes. Make sure you're talking into your microphone. So, a tiny grain of sand will look like that. Well, I never knew that. I always find something new every single day. Yeah, so anyway, it's it's super cool. Quantum entanglement is a fact. And here's the deal. So, so if if sci- if this science is true, this shows that we are truly living in a magical world because Here's what happens. When two things have been put together, they can be separated by two miles, two billion miles, two billion light years, and they still remain. Ava just gave us a huge burp. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> yeah, that was not a burp. It was like. It was on my tongue. I, it was like this. It sounds like a burp, but it, it's not really. Sorry. I, I'm, so, I'm like, so not editing that out. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, okay, back to the quantum entanglement. Get so, too much. yes, you're getting very distracted. So, anyway, so here's the, here's the thing. So, what do you think that means for your life and my life? If two things that have been joined together, if we separate them by two inches, two miles, two billion miles, and they still remain connected by some kind of invisible force... That's kind of that's kind of magic, right? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay, we've got a case of the giggles. So, we need to we need to move back to the topic at hand, which by the way, did you know that the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission was just a few days ago? Really? I did not know that. It's been 50 years, guys. 50 years since somebody has actually touched down on the moon. What do you think about that? Has anybody touched base on the moon since then? Well, we're going to be talking about that. Yeah, there's been there's been several other ones, but not as many as you would think. But 50 years ago, what do you know that's 50 years old? And don't say me. I'm not 50 years old. Um, Papa's older than 50. Yes, he's older than 50. What do you know that's 50 years old, Ava? No, um, my my dog named Beetle is about fifty years old. Eh. Incorrect. She is she is seventeen. Uh, she is she is in human years. Yeah, in human years. So, she, so that means she's way older than fifty. Yeah, because you know a dog can only go to twenty years old and then they'll just die. So that's pretty old for a dog. Yeah, it's it's very old. Okay, so. So anyway, 50 is crazy old because both of y'all are how old again? Two? Two? That's what y'all are acting like over here. They're, they're, I wish I had a video camera because they're over here making faces at each other. It's very distracting. And they're hand dancing. They just got out of a cheer camp, and so they insist on hand dancing. Who, who else out there likes to hand dance when their parents are doing something important? Um, well, we just like our songs and our dance. So we're trying to practice it, but we just can't remember it, so we're just doing some hand dancing for fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth, okay? <laughs> okay, so let me let me talk about the Apollo 11 mission. So, okay, girls, I'm going to take you through the history of this mission, and I want to hear from you guys what y'all think. Okay. Wow. So, the American effort to send astronauts to the moon had its origins in an appeal made by President John F. Kennedy. Have you guys heard of JFK? Yes. Okay. Sounds like J.J. Watt. 
<laughs> it, wrong JJ. <laughs> okay, so he it, he made a, uh, it was during a special joint session of Congress, May 25th, 1961. He said, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. It was 1961. Well, that's old still. It's very old. Okay, so so basically, so he's saying, hey, hey guys, I challenge you as the President of the United States to land a man on the moon. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Would be important for people to land a man on the moon so they could figure out about the moon because i think back when jf kennedy was president they didn't know much about the moon yeah for sure they didn't they, and, and obviously nobody had been able to get up there and take samples of what the moon was actually like i mean we kind of looked at it and i hate to confirm caroline's theory that the moon might be swiss cheese but i mean it might have been nobody had been there right it's not yeah. Spoiler alert, the moon is not Swiss cheese. And that is not Swiss cheese on my couch. That is slime. 100%. Okay, but anyway. So what, what do you think, Ava? Why would it be important for us as people, as scientists, to get to the moon? So why it's important is so we can, like, gather some moon rocks and we can test them out and see what kind of particles and what's built into the moon. And so we can figure out how the, how the Earth and all the planets are built just by looking at a grain of the moon. Right. I mean, we, we've got we've to understand our universe. To understand ourselves, we have to understand our world and our universe. And to understand that, you also have to understand your feelings and how you feel at the right time. So if you're like at a happy party where your friend just took your favorite kind of glow stick, are you still are you gonna be like really mad and throw a big huge tantrum? Or are you gonna just be happy and say, Oh, you can just keep it and then for the party, but when we leave you must give it back because that's my special toy. So yeah. I think we should send that memo to Congress, Ava. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so not only do we have to understand our world and our universe, but at the time, the United States was involved in something called the Cold War. Do you guys know what the Cold War is? No, um, fun fact, Lily actually told us about, um, which I've got a dance. She actually told us about World War One and World War Two. So we've never, we don't, we've only heard of World War One and Two. We've never heard of a cold war. So. Yeah, so when we think of war, war is is something that's seen as like active combat, right? Tanks, guns, people fighting, but the cold war was a little bit different. The people cold dying. people dying, uh, which is the terrible part of war, but the cold war was a little bit different. It wasn't active combat. What it was was this Basically, it was a it was a struggle of power between the United States and the Soviet Union, which the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. It's basically it was this conglomeration of of countries that were near Russia, which it's generally basically Russia today. And um, we were struggling for world domination. And the way that we were doing it was threatening um, the use of nuclear bombs. OK, so. So in at the at the core of nuclear bombs and nuclear technology is is technology period. So we were trying to show our superiority. So one of the ways that we could have done that was by putting a man on the moon. So at the time the Soviet Union was trying very very hard 
to get their astronauts, which they call cosmonauts, into space while we were doing the same thing. In fact, you know what? They shot a dog into space. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Did it die? So, so no. They on the moon, actually, they sent a dog with them so they could act, so it could actually see and smell and feel what, their, what it would feel for a dog on the moon. It, just one part. You must have air. You must have gravity boots for one. And you, if you take your gravity boots off, you won't be able to get them back because... Okay, I don't know where you're going with this. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but seriously, so the dog did not go to the moon. Just to clarify, the dog actually just orbited the Earth. Yep. But, and also a monkey went, and I do think the monkey actually died. Yeah, I know, it's terrible. But I need to, did I need to. Did it lose air? I, th I think that the rocket crashed. But I need to, I need to look into those facts. But, but anyway, but. But the United States spent about five years working on technology. So on January, I, I'm sorry. Um, this is, well, this was the first time. So there was going to be one mission before Apollo 11. This was January 27th, 1967. It was in Cape Canaveral, Florida, because that's where we shoot all of our space rockets off. And where is Command Central? Houston. That's right, Houston, Texas, which is not too far from us, right? Um, the, the very first man launch actually ended up with a fire on the launch pad, and three astronauts were actually killed during this time. Yeah. Now, flash forward to 1969. It is July the 19th. After traveling 240,000 miles in 76 hours, the Apollo 11 entered into a lunar orbit, okay? So imagine this. So the entire contraption that includes the Columbia rocket and then also the Eagle lunar module, which the lunar module is what actually lands on the moon, and the Columbia rocket orbits the moon so we've got one guy orbiting and we've got the other two guys going off on the eagle it entered into orbit um after traveling about 250,000 miles okay on the next day at 1 46 p.m the lunar module the eagle which we already talked about who which was manned by um, neil armstrong and buzz aldrin separated from the command module and so the command module was the Columbia, and Michael Collins was actually in charge of that spacecraft. Two hours later, the Eagle began its descent towards the lunar surface, and at 4.17 p.m., the craft actually touched down on the southwestern edge of the Sea of Tranquility. There we go, CC, one of your Cs. Armstrong immediately radioed to Mission Control in Houston, and... The very with a very famous message. Do you guys know what that that message is? Yes, Cece. That's one small step for man and one and one giant leap for man. Sixty seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Forty feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. Three feet, two and a half down, straight shadow, four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little, ready, down and a half, 30 seconds, forward, just, ready, ready, contact light, okay, engine stop, APA at a descent, boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off, and then I'm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, tw Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. No, you're very close. You're very close. But before they did that, they said, the eagle has landed. Okay? And so what they were talking about is that the lunar module actually hit the surface of, of the moon. So this was a big deal. This was the first time a mancraft had ever been on the surface of the moon.
okay? Now, at 10.39 p.m., five hours ahead of the original schedule, Armstrong actually opened the hatch of the lunar module. As he made his way down the module's ladder, a television camera attached to the craft recorded his progress and beamed the signal back to Earth, where hundreds of millions of people watched him. Have you guys ever seen that footage? No. Even though... When Even at school? Mm-mm. We have only saw it in first grade how the lunar eclipse happened. Okay, so I'm going to definitely link the original footage of the absolutely into the into the these show notes and I'm going to show you guys when we get done recording this podcast cuz it's it's pretty amazing. So, he opened it up and he actually took his first steps on the moon. What do you guys think about that? Like wh- what would you be thinking if you were the first person to ever step foot on the moon? I would be that um, it would be really cool, and you would become famous, and you'll be in books, you'll be in stories, and all a lot of stuff. And then you you'll be that first footprint on the actual moon. And so your rocket will leave. So you'll actually leave a footprint. You'll get to take home a moon rock. It'll be so amazing. Well, and you know his footprint is still there because there's there's no atmosphere, there's no air movement on on the moon. Yeah, his footprint's there. What what about well, you? Isn't that, that's pretty cool? Yeah. But what about you, Cece? What would you think if you were the first person to ever step foot on the moon? I would eat the moon. It's made out of rock. Quit being a silly head. It's I mean, made out of Swiss cheese, not rock. Okay. You're fired. She's definitely fired. She's definitely fired. So at 10.56 p.m., as Armstrong stepped off the ladder and planted his foot on the moon's powdery surface, he spoke his very famous quote, which he actually said was misinterpreted. So, Cece, what's that very famous quote? That's one small step. That's one small step for... A man, one giant leap for mankind. Yeah, that's this is this is what Neil Armstrong said that he actually meant to say. But of course, it kind of comes off as that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Down there, uh, it's very fine. Now, now step off the laminate. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful. Okay, how did, how did he plant his foot on the moon? Because if you have plants, you have to put grass and soil and seed. How do you plant your footstep on the actual moon? You just step onto the moon. Yeah, it's a plant is kind of like an expression. So uh, if you if you can imagine a plant, a plant is stable in the soil. It's kind of strong there. To plant is is basically the same thing. So does make does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's just I'm learning all these expressions and idioms. I get confused. Okay, people. Hey. I get confused. That's that's cool. That's cool, chicken drool. The, the uh, there we go. What do you what do you call this when you hit the when you hit the fists? Blowing it up. Yeah, blowing it up. Blow it up, CC. It's called la 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 la. I guess I'm you're you're rehired. Okay, but no more Swiss cheese. You're banned from talking about Swiss cheese. And and literally, if if an astronaut went up to the moon and started eating it, like we would just have to send you straight to the sun because I don't even know. I, I you know what? And, and in fact, you just ruined your career for ever going to Mars because you said that you would step out onto this newly unexplored territory and take a bite out of it. <laughs> You're a wackadoodle. It would burn my mouth up. <laughs> okay, actually, if if people would go and eat the moon, we would have no nighttime sky. We would have no. Um, Are we sky. even talking about this? Are we even talking about this? I would not eat the got, entire moon. Cece just gets distracted and distracts all of us and talking about switch cheese. Stop. Okay. 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 So, let me continue with what happened with these with these astronauts being on the moon so about 19 minutes later buzz aldrin actually joined him and together they took photographs of the terrain 
planted the U.S. flag. So Ava, you had already talked about that. They staked it out there and ran a few simple scientific tests and, and spoke to the president at the time, which was Richard Nixon. So by 1.11 a.m. on July the 21st, which that's coming up here pretty soon, both astronauts were back in the lunar module and the hatch was closed. The two men slept the night on the surface of the moon and at 1.54, the Eagle began its ascent back to the command module. So how cool is that? That's pretty cool, but can I say something? Please. What if they slept on the moon? Dude, that would be amazing. Like you literally got out your sleeping bags and slept on the surface of the moon. Well, you know what would probably happen? You won't have your astronaut. You'll have astronaut pajamas. And what that is, it's a thinner, you know, a thinner version of the astronaut suit. And what it'll do is it'll take everything up and it'll just move around. And so you would just be nowhere. You would just have to find your rocket and then you would be, and you'll probably run out of air and then you'll die. So, yeah. So Ava has a much more bleak interpretation of how that would camping out would go. But yeah, I, th I think what you're, you're getting at, cause you know what, there's a lot of radiation, there's a lot of dust, there's no atmosphere. But anyway, the idea is amazing. And you these two no guys, yeah, well, there's, there is gravity. There's some gravity. It's just much less than the earth. I mean, how amazing is that, that these two guys slept on the surface of the moon? I, I think that's pretty cool. It's like the ultimate camping trip. Um, they also left a plaque on the moon. Now listen to this, ladies. It read, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot on the moon. July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. That's pretty amazing. Now, what would, okay, if you planted a plaque on, on the surface of the moon, what would it say? The moon is Swiss cheese. Oh my gosh. What about you, Ava? The moon is the most the moon is the most amazing thing of this whole world. So what that what I mean is the moon actually brings everything. It actually brings the nighttime sky, it brings the tides, and it brings a lot of the things that Earth cannot do on its own. Um, I know what I would put on my plaque. First space chick on the moon. No. Okay. Y'all don't like that? Okay. You just put Kara Bart, the first woman on the moon. Yo, yo, yo. No, but seriously, that's, I mean, so in, uh, uh, just think about how amazing that is. That plaque is still up there to this day. Make sure you're, t make sure you're speaking into your mic. It's not graffiti, okay? It was a plaque. It was a wonderful, wonderful plaque. But, so, so this is, so, again, 50 years ago, two men walked on the moon. Now, from that time until 1972, we've actually had six manned missions that have been to the moon. But guess what? I mean, 1972 was even before I was born, okay? Man, man, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody else has been back to the moon. In fact, nobody else has been. Don't don't you think that if we landed on the moon 50 years ago, we should be able to go to, let's say, Mars? I mean, what do y'all think? Mars is way too hot for people to um, land on because it's more closer to the sun than it is from Earth. And if you're thinking about going to Jupiter... Bad idea. It's way too cold. Yeah, but, okay, so uh, Mars is certainly the closest planet, but we could develop, and I don't think Mars is as hot. I think you're thinking of Venus, because Mars is kind of a cold rock, but we could develop technology that could really make it possible, right? I think that we could if we put effort into it, but we should have, by now, our country should have been able to go to Mars. 
I agree. I agree. And now, now here's here's my charge. Now I'm not I'm not President JFK. All I am is a, I'm a writer. I do a podcast and I'm a mom, so that means I sweep a lot and oh, too. I, yes, and I wash a lot of dirty clothes. But I am putting that charge out to all of my favorite science chicks and science dudes out there. I think you guys are going to be the ones that are going to step foot on the surface of Mars. I mean, what do y'all think? Just you- to embarrass Miss Kira, she, she cleans a lot of dirty underwear. <laughs> oh, true dat, true dat. I clean a lot of dirty underwear. But you know what? That's what that's what moms do. Moms and dads. Moms and dads, we, we, have, we have the tough jobs, but somebody's got to do it. I mean, are you going to really clean your dirty drawers? No. Okay. But seriously, so back to the topic at hand. I want to know what you guys think. Why have we not been back to the moon, and why don't we go further? Why don't we go to Mars? Send me an email, universeinaseashell at gmail.com, or just simply respond to this episode send you know comment in the in the comment section tell me your opinion why have we not been back to the moon and why aren't we going further do you guys want to go further yes i want to see mars i want to see saturn i want to see all the planets okay guys so but before go ahead ava it's like you're going further in a in a running competition so say you only have to go a mile. The next day you gotta go ten miles. The next day you gotta go thirty miles. That's tough. So you just gotta step foot, go into your rocket, fly to the moon, get back in your rocket, and go further. Well, the number one thing we need is we need smart kids like you guys, because we have to have better technology than we have now, obviously. Okay, we're going to have to have more efficient rockets. We've got to have better jet propulsion because basically what we're doing right now is we're sending people to space in combustion engines. So what I mean by that is we are basically sending people to outer space on flaming rockets. Okay, so you're like sitting on a giant, um, uh, what, what do they call those firework things? What do they call them? It, 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 the 4th of July. I can't think of the name right now, but anyway, it is. It's this flaming rocket. We've got to figure out different ways to traverse big portions of space, and it's got to be different than using a gas-powered engine. I have an idea. Okay. We could use a a remote control. Oh, have like remote missions? You know what, Uh, Caroline, we've had remote missions. We've had remote missions to Mars, to Saturn. Saturn was the most recent one. Um, there's a, a big, amazing telescope that's floating out there called the Hubble telescope. And they, the Hubble telescope has created some of the most amazing images that you could ever see. They've captured nebulas. They've captured the center of the Milky Way. They've captured, um, these, uh, all kinds of amazing stars that are dying, that are being born. I mean, just incredible, incredible stuff. Neutron stars. It's red dwarfs, the big ones. I could go on and on and on, but we don't have people going out there. Now, one of the big constraints is our body, okay? So it's very difficult for human beings to travel in space. And the main thing is the peeing and the pooping. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, why? How do you pee and poop when there's no gravity? You know what? There's there's very special toilets that astronauts have to use. But it, it, these are these are real things. So anyway, my challenge is that you guys need to be thinking about these ways that we can move beyond the the frontiers that we've already conquered. Let's move beyond the moon. Let's get to Mars. Tell me what your thoughts are. How do we improve the experience for the astronauts? How do we improve the technology that we're using? Number one, our combustion engine. How do we make sure that astronauts are safe from the radiation, from the heat, from the cold? How do we do that? Well, what I think is just not a topic, but when we go to outer space, 
They should put the rocket fire a little bit. Well, not too hot, not too cold, but just at the right temperature, like you're taking like a shower. You have to have it at the right temperature where it's not too freezing cold, where it's not too hot, where it will be the right amount of temperature because that's how Pluto didn't become a plant anymore. They it crashed and and the and it and it actually exploded because the um fire on the rocket was too hot. So that's why it's not a planet because it exploded because of the fire under the rocket. Okay. Do they use porta potties? They use special suction toilets. We're, we're, we're definitely digressing. We're definitely digressing. So I want to leave you guys with a few observations made by an astronaut named Scott Kelly. So Scott Kelly has the record for being in space longer than any other person. He was up there for actually for a year, okay, if you can believe that or not. He was up there for a year, and he has a few things that he wants to tell us about what space does to your body. So these are the things that I want you guys to think about. Number one, space smells like burning metal. Okay, now this is a direct quote from him. He goes, the smells vary depending on what segment you're in. And when he means segment, he means kind of where you're at. Because he spent a lot of time in the International Space Station, which do you guys know what that is? Yes. Well, it's this big space station that orbits our Earth that astronauts pretty regularly go into, and it's kind of like a big floating house where they go up there, they perform scientific experiments, they make observations, and it's it's kind of like a giant lab. But anyway, so he spent an entire calendar year up there, and he said that Smells vary depending on what segment you're in. Sometimes it has an antiseptic smell, so that's kind of like a cleaner or a detergent. Sometimes it has an odor that smells like burning garbage. But the smell of space when you open the hatch smells like burning metal to me. What do you guys think about that? It smell It smells like burning metal when you when you just open the hatch? Okay. And he actually has the world record because you're supposed to only be up there for about like 3 to 21 to 20 hours. So that's pretty long for a man to be up there for a whole entire year. I bet well, one of the reasons family. one of the reasons that he was up there was to study the the effects on the human body. Here's another thing he says. He says microgravity makes your arms feel feel really weird he says your arms don't hang by your side in space like they do on earth because there's no gravity it feels awkward to have them floating in front of me it's just more comfortable to have them folded i i don't even have them floating in my sleep i put them in my sleeping bag i mean wouldn't that be kind of weird to have your arms floating out like this yeah yeah and he said and again one of the hardest things to do in space is to pee so but so that that kind of wraps it up. So so guys, happy happy anniversary to the Apollo 11, to one of mankind's greatest achievements. Um, guys, listening out there, thank you so much for listening. And and again, I challenge you guys to move forward in this new frontier of space travel. We've got to get beyond the moon. We need to get to Mars, but we need to rethink the way that we're doing everything. So, Cece, thank you so much for being my host as always. And Ava, you're, welcome. you're super fun. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us. You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Adios. Bye.